No,
Well, technically, it is good afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome uh, to a really significant event. And it's a great honor uh, to welcome you all to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and to our Humphrey School of Public Affairs. My name is Eric Kaler, and it's my pleasure and honor to serve as president of the University of Minnesota. I'd like to begin by thanking our special guests, Governor Tim Walls and Brianna Rushbach. Our community members, including from the University of Minnesota's community of faculty, staff, students, and alumni, as well as members of our broader shared community, welcome. And I'm grateful for our host, the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and Dean Laura Bloomberg, who's doing just a wonderful job as Dean. And we're grateful to the Humphrey School's Center for the Study of Governance and Politics for making this event happen. Now, I have to brag a little bit, and so I'll remind you that the Humphrey School is a top 10 public affairs graduate school in the country. And of course, in Minnesota terms, we call that pretty good. The school is named after Hubert H. Humphrey, former vice president, senator and, senator and mayor of Minneapolis. But of course, his real legacy is not in those titles, but his legacy is found in how he raised his own voice and amplified the voices of others, and how he acted fighting for human rights and civil rights and treating all he met with dignity and respect. His legacy endures at the Humphrey School and more broadly at the University of Minnesota. And this event today exemplifies Humphrey's dedication to meaningful and respectful dialogue. The University of Minnesota adds great value to the state of Minnesota, including our unique position as a driver of innovation and discovery our education of leaders and skilled employees for Minnesota's workforce in 21st century jobs, and as a cultural force to produce engaged and educated citizens. Speaking of engaged and educated citizens, I should remind you that the new Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota, Peggy Flanagan, is a U of M alumna. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree on the Twin Cities campus. And half of Governor Wall's commissioners have a connection to the U, either as alumni or instructors. We're proud of that. The future of the, of the state of Minnesota, I believe, begins at the University of Minnesota, and there's no other institution in the state that does what we do. But to succeed, we depend on a strong partnership with the legislature and the governor to maintain our excellence and to serve Minnesotans. It's my pleasure now to introduce our speakers today, Governor Tim Walls and our moderator, Brianna Brushbach, and welcome them both to a seat here on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. As you know, Tim Walls is Minnesota's 41st governor. Governor Walls served six terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from our first congressional district. And before that election, he served 24 years in the Army National Guard and was a teacher and coach. Our moderator, Brianna Brushbach, is a political reporter for NPR News and an adjunct faculty member at the Humphrey School. She, of course, got her start in journalism covering city government for the Minnesota Daily. She's also worked with the Associated Press, St. Paul Pioneer Press, and MinPost. We look forward to your discussion. Thank you again and over to our panel. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. It looks like we have a full house. And thank you, Governor, because I imagine you're a little bit busy right now. You have a budget due next week. Just a bit. Yeah. No, well, glad we, to be here. We appreciate you spending this hour with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Uh, just a quick programming note. Uh, I have a lot of questions that to ask, but I'm sure you do as well. Um, if you haven't grabbed a note card already, they should be going around. Just fill out any questions you have, and they'll be brought up to me at some point, and I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. Uh, but I figured we'd start uh, with some of the news you made yesterday on the Line 3 proposal. Uh, you had you decided to continue a petition started by the governor's uh, governor Dayton's administration, and in doing that, you said uh, you said projects like Line Three need not only a building permit to move forward; they also need a social permit. Could you explain a little bit more what you mean by a social permit? Because I haven't heard that term. Before. Sure. Well, thank you to President Kaler and to the Humphrey for uh, for having us, Brianna. Thank you, and each of you for taking time to uh, to engage in the the civic discourse that matters and. Uh, we did get started right out of the gate with one that I know is very passionate to people. And this issue uh, of how we view energy, how we view a future of moving away from carbon-based fuels, uh, how we view projects as they intersect with communities. Uh, and in Minnesota, that means intersecting with uh, 11 of our sovereign nations who have a different uh, 
intersection with state government and federal government. With that being said on these issues of energy, I my time in Congress, I think for most of us, it, it seems a little ludicrous that in 2019, you have to confess that you believe in the science of climate change. Um, it's there, but the reality of of how quickly are we able to move because we move at a glacial pace in in legislation, and I think many of us feel like there's not an op, there, there's not time to move at that pace. And so, trying to figure out how do we set those goals. What I have always stated on these types of projects um, that we need to follow the science, we need to follow the law, we need to follow the process. One of the things is is that certainly in the case science can be changing, um, laws possibly process maybe. And in this situation, I think the belief is, and when I talk about that, the law as it's written and what's at stake on this is a certificate of need that the Public Utilities Commission issued is written from a statute that deals with power plants, not pipelines. So the interpretation of the 12 points that were in there to show certificate of need, 11 of them were relatively non-controversial. The one on need and how do you measure need is obviously very controversial for people based on this idea of how do you know you're going to need this much fossil fuels if next week you're going to unveil a budget that tries to move us to electrification of our transportation grid. And so my take was is that the process was being followed and when the Dayton administration and the Commerce Department determined that they were going to appeal the certificate of need to get clarification from the appeals court, which is the rightful way they can do that, Outside groups can do that, but having the Commerce Commission do it was something a little different. Once they did that, it's my belief that that became the process. And that was moving forward other than a technicality that vacated it. And it felt like there was an expectation amongst people that this should be heard in court on appeal to determine going forward. I also think it gives us an opportunity to reset maybe some of these relationships of how do we deal with those sovereign nations? How do we talk about, because some of them have come to agreements with Enbridge and that is between their sovereign government and Enbridge to come up with that. And then Minnesota to intersect with both of those. So my take is if you can't get people's buy-in to believe that there's validity behind a discussion, the social permit, it makes it very difficult to get these done with without great disruption. And I think this is the best way to ensure that people now at the end, and I'm sure you'll ask the question, certainly not going to please everyone. I, I certainly found out in this job, I now pretty much angered everyone on that. Um, but I think it has to be able to principle. And I would just, you know, end this question with saying this, that we're watching this play out on the federal level, the role of the executive as a, po as a co-equal branch with the legislative branch, that those believe that the executive should just have full authority to stop something outside the process in my opinion, is a very dangerous proposition because if you fall on the side and says, well, the governor should just, just stop this, stop this, the right thing to do, then you would be making the case that the next governor should just build one without any environmental review, without any process involved. I think I have to stay true to the process to ensure that that is the protection against the checks and balances being weakened. Well, what about the people who wanted this project to go forward, the business groups and some unions? Uh, they said the process was followed. Uh, are they going to, on other projects going forward, where permitting is, is something that's required, are you going to continue this philosophy for those things? I'm going to continue the philosophy of following the process. And again, I think the, the point of debate on this was, is they were saying when the Public Utilities Commission ruled on the certificate of need, that was the end of it. Um, that could be, and I think that's a valid point to argue, until the administration entered into that and did the appeal. I think it would, again, I we can differ on whether we interpret this right. It's my belief that a lot of people are under the expectation that that is part of the process. I think most of those groups know, and they believe that the court will rule fairly. And if they believe the Public Utilities Commission ruled correctly, then the, the appeals court will rule the same, and then they will they will move forward. Yeah. Well, you were back in Washington last week in the House. Didn't you just leave Congress? Or I did, but it was so great to be on the other side of things because I told them this. Everything I said about the federal government needs to do these decisions was wrong. The states need to make these decisions. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the Transportation Committee. Yeah, well, and you were talking about the gas tax there, which yes. obviously was a huge part of your campaign. Not a lot of candidates have talked about that in their campaign before because they've seen it as potentially unpopular, but you did and you won. Do you see this as a mandate to take this issue now to the Capitol? Well, I was back to 
to the first hearing of the Transportation Committee was to talk about the need for infrastructure investments. And the National Governors Association, made up of the 50 state governors and the five territorial governors, picked me to go out and be the spokesperson for the governors who want an aggressive policy. And they did that, I think, for the very reason is, is you know, conventional wisdom says don't run for office and tell people you're going to raise their taxes. That doesn't work. But here's what I am tired of. Don't promise people free stuff if you're not going to tell them how you're going to pay for it. And if you're not going to invest in infrastructure, that is not telling people you're lowering their taxes. That's telling them that they're going to continue to be in gridlock. They're going to continue to see deteriorating roads and they're going to continue to add to the cost. So I hadn't seen this in decades. And if you, if you get a chance and you have nothing to do in your life, go look at C-SPAN <laughs> at that hearing last week. And it was bipartisan, including my friends, my Republican friends on the other side of the aisle, like Mark Meadows, who's the president's friend. You hear this name in the news. Mark in open hearing said, well, I'm willing to take that tough vote and potentially raise revenues. But what I need to see is your willingness um, to move these projects faster, to make sure that we're not holding them up in undue regulation, which uh, my certainly pledges to do that and not cut environmental standards, but to try and move them quicker. There is a move to an understanding this nation's infrastructure is crumbling. It is not going to get better. And here in Minnesota on next Tuesday, and I was speaking with county commissioners, I'm going to propose a generational plan to move us towards a new uh, infrastructure that is going to be based on electrification of our grids, of autonomous vehicles, of transit being central in the core areas, and ways that we can see transportation and livable communities and uh, quality of life interchange together. And that is going to be proposing how you're going to pay for it. It's unfair for me to tell you, I'm going to create this wonderful transportation system. And then they'll tell you, oh, and, and there's plenty of money out there. Well, then you go tell the nursing homes you're going to take the money from them to build highways. Or you go tell the schools you're going to take money. Or you come to the University of Minnesota and say you're going to double tuition costs because that's the only way to come up with the $18 billion over the next 20 years. I will be long gone from this job, probably long gone from this earth, but I have <laughs> to figure out how to not just limp along with doing some things. And those who say, oh, just use the surplus, that will do it over. That surplus will shrink in the next forecast because that's the way things work. It's not dependable. And so I am going to propose that. Um, we'll debate it here in Minnesota and, and come to a conclusion, but not doing anything on infrastructure costs billions every year. To not spend a penny on infrastructure costs us billions. Idling tax, accidents, safety concerns, I was one of those people who had nothing better to do and did go back and rewatch it. But, uh, That's why we're here. <laughs> I'm curious, though, you know, you talked about in the campaign, but now you have to go to the Capitol. I mean, how do you get le the legislature to do this? It hasn't been increased since 2008. And then it also took 20 years to get that done as well. Um, you want to answer? Just one moment. I we answered. just talked about this. If I could ask a question. Thank you so much. Uh, how are you going to get this to pass? Because the Senate Republicans are not interested in this proposal. Uh, they're saying they want to use the surplus like you just mentioned. How do yeah. you get this to move? Well, this is the part about going in, 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 and talking to the public. And this is another issue of, of the, the social permit. The social permit to ask people to use their dollars and how you're going to use that. What I need to do is go across the state, make the case of what are we getting for this? What, what uh, please if you could just let the governor speak on the this way issue. the way we're able to go out and talk to them there and i'm i'm convinced of this minnesotans understand two things very clearly that you get what you pay for and there's an expectation that they're willing to pay taxes if they believe that they're fair and where they're going so i think the case is is to go out and i will go into each of these districts the thing that i found so interesting as a member of congress people who push back on any spending on infrastructure or any spending on projects and actually vote and actually voted actually voted we're going to actually if you keep interrupting we're going to have to ask you to leave part part of the social permit that goes with this is a respect and please, is a respect in the conversation of where we're going, of all of the things that tied to... Have you changed your mind about, like, the what, what I would ask is, is engage in the conversation the way we're doing it. There's a lot of folks coming in, all of these issues intertwined together. And part of this... You're going to be asked to leave if you continue to interrupt the program and the governor while he is actually trying to respond to you. So please be respectful uh, as we try to move forward. Thank you so much. And this piece on... 
on the transportation funding of what I've seen is, is people who push against it, what I have yet to ever see as an elected official not be at a ribbon cutting. And what I mean by that is, is we need to show, and I need to show an efficiency in how we're delivering these projects. And I think if we don't tackle this now at this point in time, we're D minus by the uh, Civil Engineering Society rates us as a D minus. It gets worse when we talk about deficiencies of bridges, but I don't think we're preparing for what the future looks like with, and again, I know where the gas tax intersects with this, electrification of our transportation system. There's going to be very little gas tax collected if everybody's driving electric vehicles. How do we build the infrastructure for recharging? And how do we deal with autonomous vehicles and be one of the first states to test autonomous movement of, uh, of products? All of these things tie towards reduction of carbons and the need for fossil fuels. If you're not addressing one over the other, you're not going to get to that bigger picture. And so as they all tie together and thinking about it, Again, I don't say this to be facetious. When people come to events to talk about this, we came, the vast majority of us, on fossil fuels. But those very same people understand trying to move that bridge to a point where we're able to reduce carbon footprint, where we're able to reduce carbon futures, is going to engage in this conversation on transportation. So what I'm going to do is try and broaden the trans around this. It's going to be made a simple argument. The governor's trying to raise your taxes, and that's the way we go. Uh, we're going to ask you to leave so that we can continue on with the program and talk about some other topics as well, which I think other people are here to interest here mm -hmm. interested in. And maybe let's focus on your budget because you're going to yeah. be uh, introducing this next week. You've previewed pieces of it. You want to? Uh, you've talked about pieces of this local government aid. You want yes. to see some increases there. You want to see some increases for Native American communities, also angel investor credit. Yeah. Uh, but you, on the campaign trail, you also talked about education and health care. Are, are there going to be enough resources to do everything you want to do in this budget? Yeah, this this is always the challenge of the, the limited resource you have and how do you invest them smartly. It's my premise, especially on budgets. Budgets are fiscal documents. And the thing I like about state government is there's a constitutional responsibility to balance that budget, to be fiscally sound, not just this year, but in the tails or the out years that go out there. But I also feel very strongly that a budget is a moral document as much as a fiscal document. It's going to be a reflection of our values. And it's my belief on the quality of life in Minnesota that separates us is the way that we can be competitive and ensure quality of life for all of our citizens is first and foremost to focus on education. We can't afford to let a single person drop through. We have to view education holistically. And when I say that, when I'm crafting a budget, what I know as a public school teacher, if a child came to my classroom and they had slept in a car or slept in a shelter, if they were hungry, or they had not seen a dentist in several years, the ability for me to deliver a geography lesson is basically zero. And so when I talk about education and the idea of making education accessible and raising our standards, we're gonna start out with programs in housing that says homework starts with a home and trying to figure that out. So for me, the belief is we create a pathway to the future that people choose through education, but we do it in conjunction of understanding some of those bedrock principles that have to be in place. And so this budget will focus on education. It will focus on, on different pathways, whether it be pre-K that we know that works, um, focusing on early childhood education, but focusing on those pathways to higher ed and, and making the case, and this one's frustrating to me, um, the shift in the costs of maybe some of the students you're setting in here that the state had a bigger investment. This budget will be a down payment on shifting that, that I do not certainly see education as a for-profit endeavor. I see it as an investment in the growth of the economy and the well-being of the state in the future. So you'll see that. And healthcare. Again, I, I've dealt with this in Congress. I was at the heart of the ACA. I represented Southern Minnesota's first district with the Mayo Clinic and others. I've seen rural healthcare, and I also served as the ranking member on the VA on the delivery of new ways to look at telemedicine in the way of delivering this. What I know is this, we have states in this country that have 40% childhood obesity rates. We will forever have a conversation about how to fix that if we're not focusing on preventative things. If we're not focusing on holistic health, which means where are people living, because housing is a part of that, mental health as a part of a holistic approach to this, and all of the preventative front side of that. Getting people healthcare 
is not only a moral responsibility in my mind, it makes good economic sense because it prevents the cost on the back end. So in the state of Minnesota, we rank very high, but we're starting to downslide on that. It's my goal that if you go hand in hand to have the best educated and the healthiest population, you will clearly have the strongest economy because you will have the best capacity to innovate, the best capacity um, to attract workers here. The third piece of that uh, budget that's going to be there is community prosperity. This idea is that communities know best. So I'm talking about things like local government aid, county program aid, so that local communities have the capacity to make the investments as they see fit. I think we're at a point now where local local communities, local, Please don't interrupt the program. Okay. Thank you very much. You'll be asked to leave if you continue to interrupt well, the program. Thank the you. The door is open and we've committed. If you want to dialogue, come dialogue. If you want to protest, protest. But the two don't have to be at odds of one another. We have spoken to every group out there. I am the first gov Let me finish, please. I am the first governor that has ever gone out both before I was elected and after I elected and met with every single one of our indigenous people and been on the phone. Every single one of our tribal leadership were called in the previous week to consult and have meaningful consultation on that. That's how this is done. So what doesn't happen is not every meet, not every, please, not every meeting is going to happen at the place and choosing that you ask, but they are happening. And the meaningful dialogue is happening and we are communicating. The thing that gets hard is this doesn't build that social commit or the capacity to come together in places where we can have a conversation about it. Because the that is that is patently false. That is patently false because those have happened. But here's the thing, and I would ask before we move on to the rest of the questions: dominating a question that's happening with child and mental health dominating a conversation that people want to have about housing, dominating a conversation about the delivery of education and racial disparities, because that's not the issue you want to talk about at the time, is depriving us of that conversation. I can't help. That, can you please leave? Thank you. If someone could please take them out of this so we can continue with the program. Thank you. Can we t let's talk about healthcare because sure. this is going to be a big issue facing you this year. You have two programs that are set to expire, yes. the provider tax, but also the reinsurance program. I'm curious what you uh, want to do on both of those. I know you support the provider tax going th going forward, but Republicans are going to say it's a tax increase. And they actually said today they don't want that to go forward. So how are you going to push for that? Yeah, again, I'll often hear this in about, it's a fair point to ask about a level of taxation but that always has to be asked of what are you getting for those tax dollars? So when people tell me, and there are groups that are telling me their goal is to move Minnesota to the, to the middle points of taxation, to be states 20 to 30 in that. Now, I would argue if you're going to move Minnesota from where they're at in investments, you're going to move us out of our position as a top education state, a top income state, a top outcome of health cares, a top some of those. So it comes back and forth, uh, 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 meaning that it's a give and take if you do that. Now, I'm not saying that if you tax, you're instantly going to get good outcomes. What I can tell you is the provider tax in Minnesota was able to provide health care for thousands of people. We are the state with the most insured people, and we had, up until this year, the best health outcomes. We can do better with things like vaccination and different ways to deliver that. So the provider fee that was put in there or the provider tax, the 2% on the providers, has provided that backstop that did all of that, and especially to rural uh, communities. I understand from the provider's perspective that they said, this is hitting us, this is going on. I think most of us understand those get passed on to the consumer. So that that is not an illegitimate argument. The point being is, if that is pulled back, it puts a $900 million hole in the budget. If it is not filled from somewhere else, that will take 900 million from higher ed, that will take 900 million from transportation, that will take that money. And that's a fair debate. What I would tell the Republicans is, I spent two years traveling this state and I made the case that this is a state that invests in education, invests in healthcare, invests in community prosperity. I told them clearly before November that I believed we need to invest through a gas tax and we needed to renew the provider tax. I just remind them and tell them this, that a historic number of people voted for that belief 
was a better way for Minnesota to go. So I'm going to go and make that case to them that I'm listening and I'm open to this, but I am not willing to drop off 35,000 people off medical assistance or Minnesota care. And I'm not willing to send us back in health outcomes that in the long run cost us more. So I will make that case. Reinsurance. Uh, this is a little more challenging. That four or 5% of your neighbors who fall in the individual market, they don't get their health care through their provider, they're not of Medicare age, and they're making too much money, 400% of the federal poverty limit, especially in areas like Southeast Minnesota, they are being asked to pay twenty six dollars to $30,000 for their health insurance with a $10,000 deductible. That is unsustainable. And again, those who say, well, we should let the market, there's no market in health care. There's not any real market that you're going to go shop. What What's a appendectomy cost in uh, Preston. Well, it's too much there. I'm going to go over to Rushford and get my appendectomy when I'm having this. And they're, they're not going to post this because we know they're not the same. With that being said, I believe it's critically important us for stabilize the individual market. But I do have to tell you this. I question those who say there should be a free market and opposed the ACA and fought against the risk corridors now we're asking us to give hundreds of millions of dollars to the very insurance companies that are then going to try and deliver that care. I would argue that we need to secure and stabilize those individual markets. We need to triage our neighbors who are in that situation, but we need to spend our money more wisely and better on creating a market. And I have proposed in that case that there be basically the public option of the Minnesota Care buy-in that competes and lowers those premiums. Can you do both? Can you do reinsurance and a buy-in option this session? Potentially, yes. And again, I, I think we have to, in this state, you should change your expectations. I get, I know, you know, we had a press conference the other day where leader Gazelka, speaker Hortman and myself said, we're going to set some times. We're going to set some dates to get our work done by, and we're going to try and meet those. And one of the reporters asked a really great question. Well, that seems you held a press conference to do what you're supposed to do. And I said, yes, the bar is pretty low. I don't believe you should, I don't believe you should get patted on the back for what you're supposed to do. But I do think it's important. Think about this. All these things we're talking about here today are against the backdrop of what you see as another potential government shutdown. What that government shutdown is about is the equivalent of mowing your yard in terms of house type of things that you have to do. That is so routine. It should have been done just like that. The debate should have been done. They're making it like we're hired the architect, designing the house, wiring it, doing it all ourselves. No. So the answer is, is this is too much to do. We have to raise the expectations of what we're capable to do, because this is, again, I keep reiterating this. We are not playing a poker game. My job is not to have the best cards and best the Republicans in the Senate. My job is to have and help build the strongest coalition based on where this state wants to go in the best interest of our future for all of our citizens. With that being said, we have to do both. We have to start bringing down the cost of health care while taking care of those that are in the middle uh, that are being caught in this uh, market failure in individual market. Well, I want to bring up the deadline since you mentioned it. I mean, what happens if you miss a deadline? <laughs> do you know, does someone get punished or is it still kind of on the honor system and, and could that chaos of sessions past still come up? Well, this is one of those that it was our, yes, I think someone could get punished. And, um, and I, and I think it should be all of us. And that's what I said. I said, I think this is a time when I talked to leader Gazelka and speaker Hortman, um, if you didn't hear in this last election, what they were saying, they want us to get together and get things done and focus on the future. That was very clear to me is what they said. And my thing was one Minnesota, figure out how to get us to one Minnesota. So I think by doing this together, we're all walking off the cliff together. There is a potential it won't get there because I've, I found this out and you know this too. It, you've, we've witnessed it now for the past several years. If you want to gum up democracy, it's pretty easy. You can gum it up and you can stop it. But there's a price to pay with that. And that price to pay is a very frustrated electorate. And I would argue a lack of competitiveness, a drop in quality of life, and a general frustration. So it's our belief that we have an opportunity as the only divided government in the country to try and show that you can get this done. But that's going to irritate people because what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to compromise and I'm going to get held to it. You're going to have people that we celebrate the right of your First Amendment rights, the passion that goes into this issue. I lift that up. But 
if it is going to stop every other thing from happening, you can't get anything done. And each one of these issues has the potential to stop us. If Republicans in the Senate say there's no way we're re reigniting the provider tax, I'm not going to let 35,000 people lose their insurance. And I'm going to have to use what I have as the right of constitutional and uh, a co-equal branch of government to bring whatever I can bear to get that. But it goes back to our original question. If you earn the social permit and the buy-in of the vast majority of people, it's not that hard to get this done. So into your question, I think the public will be angry if we do the same old thing again. And I don't think they will pick and choose who they're going to be angry at as much. And one of the reasons is, is that I want to interject myself in there. I'll walk off the cliff with them. If they're not able to get this done in the Senate and the House, then use me to help you get that done. So you're saying no shutdown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure it's not. And I think you should have an expectation of no shutdown. Again, I know that bar is pretty low, but let's let's step over that one at least okay. that uh, that we might have a session where, um, again, I, I think and I'm going to make the case. I laid out a vision over two years. I went in front of the voters and I'm the only one of those groups that went in the voters of all of Minnesota and more than 300,000 more at any time in history voted for that vision. So I think that I'm not calling it a mandate, but I'm calling it a pretty strong position to go forward with. Um, well, we've got a, a number of questions on election issues. So I thought, sure. I'd, I'd, I mean, first, uh, something I, I don't know if I've heard you say, uh, the previous two governors required election related bills to be bipartisan, meaning they had buy in from both parties to get the signature of the governor. Is this something you? Yeah, I, I agree. And and. That again, I, I keep coming back to this. I guess we're resetting the democracy. The states are the laboratories of democracy. Um, th that sh that should be the yes, the I would agree. That sure. should be the bar. They should be bipartisan. And I mean, how can we not debate that? We should encourage everyone to vote and make it as easy as possible for people to lawfully vote. That doesn't seem like a high bar. Let's do it and make oh. that. Happen. Well, today there's a hearing on restoring felon voting rights. Uh, your your wife spoke on this issue recently in support of it. Do you support this um, as well? Yes, I'm passionate about this. I don't think you can ask someone to come back. I'm also passionate um, as we bring people out of incarceration. My goal is to try and put the Department of Corrections out of business by focusing on the front end of what gets people there. With the case is when people do that and they pay their debt to society, how do we expect them to re reintegrate if, one, they're being they're not even able to vote. We ask them to check a box before they can get an apartment. We'd ask them to make it harder to get jobs. Here's what I'm telling you. 95% 95% of people who are incarcerated are going to be our neighbors someday. I'm not saying that people shouldn't pay their debt when they make a mistake, but I am saying this, that I don't think we can define people by one moment. And we have severities of sentencing. Um, if you commit a capital crime, whatever, you may never see outside. But if you commit a crime and you show and you moved on, it makes our best interest to all of us, bring folks back in, have them, have them come back. And, and America was always defined as a country of second chances. And I believe one of the things is, is make sure you can vote that brings you back in and encourages you to participate. Uh, you're also going to be governor <laughs> during the next round of redistricting, uh, which is a really big, a big deal. And the way the process works right now is the legislature creates the maps and they send it to the governor. And in divided government, that's often meant the legislature creates the maps and the governor vetoes them. And then the court does it. Uh, how do you want the process to go? Uh, do you want to keep it as is and have it work better? Do you think that an independent commission might do this better? I got asked once, what did I learn from being in Congress? I said, well, one, I learned to never say it can't get worse. I did learn that. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But what I did learn is, is that if you want to fix Congress, I've always said there's, there's two things you can do. This idea that we have wave elections, that is a correction. That is a self-correcting mechanism. Uh, it's not the best self-correcting because everybody says, oh, we're going to throw all the bums out. Well, there's a whole new set of bums coming, so get ready for that. That's not it. The two things we could do to fix Congress are campaign finance reform and fair redistricting. I am a strong believer. I did not... I told Democrats this, that 2020 was critically important because it was a redistricting year. We needed to win the 2018 governor's race because of that. And I said, and I also want to be very clear is so that we could have fair, nonpartisan judicial or citizens redistricting committee to set fair districts, not so that I could gerrymander in favor of Democrats. I am have no interest in that. I think we should move to a system that is fair outside of this creates fair districts. Again, I have colleagues in the United States Congress, some of them 
got 98% of the vote in their congressional district. I said, I wouldn't get that amongst my family or anywhere near that. <laughs> so that, that disincentivizes compromise because every one of those people that come from those districts, they fear compromise because they will get primaried from the left or the right, depending on where they're at. We need to fix that. It's just fair. We, that, that adage, I love it. Sometimes these sayings that go in or whatever, we should not have politicians or elected officials picking their voters. It should be the other way around, the voters picking their elected officials. So here in Minnesota, I would encourage us, let's go big on this. Let's, let's lead in the nation on fair redistricting and get better government. You support medical or medical and recreational marijuana, and there's a number of questions from the crowd about this. Yep. I'm curious, are you starting to direct your uh, commissioners to look into how various pieces of a recreational program could actually look in Minnesota? Yes, and and I say this, I come at this from several different ways. On the on the medical side, um, I focused on it because of my work in the VA. And in 2007, I had a bill and gave a floor speech where I said, if we don't do something on pain management, we are going to have an opioid epidemic in this crisis that is going to crush us. It wasn't because I was like super smart in 2007. Everybody who was around this saw this coming. And one of the things I heard time and time again, at that time, think about this, we didn't even bury our warriors who committed suicide in national cemeteries. We wouldn't honor them with a military funeral and that because we saw the mental health piece. We weren't offering yoga, acupuncture, dog therapy, mass therapy, whatever. You walk into Walter Reed right now, all of those things are offered. Another piece of that pain management and PTSD reduction was the look into medicinal cannabis. We couldn't even, it's listed as a it's, it's a category one. We can't even do research on it. So I did something they said was impossible. There had never been a bill on cannabis reform ever passed out of a United States uh, Congress committee. We passed one last year because I built a coalition that included advocates for uh, cannabis legalization and the, and the American Legion and the VFW. So my take on this is, is that, again, my premise is prohibition rarely works. I tend to trust adults to make adult decisions. Uh, I think that turning a blind eye of those who say, well, people are going to drive on this, it's going to cause this. It's happening right now. We spend $40 million a year on law enforcement. And most of you in this room knows the racial disparity that goes into this and the incarceration rates are part of the problem with uh, some of the systemic issues that we have. So I have made the case, what we need to do on this, let's put a good plan in place. I've directed my commissioners to look at this. We're looking at states like Vermont and Colorado and others, some have implemented, some have not, to come up with a proposal that does smart regulation, that makes sure that there's money being uh, put into pain management and addiction services, using the extra to try and go into education and give people opportunities, but putting in place where an adult at age 21 would have the opportunity to make a wise and informed decision. If they violate that, there certainly would be things in place, but it just makes sense to me that we could do this smarter. We could do this better. We could get a better handle on what's there and, um, and then go back. And I would, I've asked them if this, anything we do on legalization of recreational cannabis must be tied to expungement of records and bringing people out of that. So. so. Uh, there's actually a question that I'm sure you'll be super excited about. What will it take for the legislature to fund the state's IT services appropriately? You're struggling right now to try to find a commissioner for that very agency saying yeah. it's a thankless job. What What is it going to take yeah. to make this work? I want to start and preface this that our minute, uh, the IT folks here, we have incredibly talented folks doing incredibly hard work. And I'm certainly not going to make any excuses, especially for the Minlar system in, in licensing. I'll, I'll mention that just a bit. We, we have to take responsibility, and, and I own that. But I also know on the day that we successfully launched the update to Minlar's, if any of you are waiting for specialty plates or title transfers, we launched on Monday. And um, it, it seems like it seems like that that's working. But on that very day, we know that Wells Fargo had an outage and things. IT is hard. IT vision, what's really hard about state government is, and, and I'm not advocating for government on autopilot, but when I called up many of these CEOs, US Bank, Target, and asked some of them, uh, they're making 10 and 15 year horizontal budgets and visions on how they're doing this. And we're fighting to get, you know, six month funding. If we get a shutdown on 
Friday, I've got to divert money away from different things to do that. So we're approaching it. And I did the Blue Ribbon Commission. We're transparent. We're bringing people in. We're thinking about what technology looks on the long run, long run, not technology for technology's sake, but improving customer service, improving people's lives in a smart way. Again, I am asking someone to do basically servant leadership. These are folks who know how to do this stuff, make millions of dollars a year. But part of it is, is improving lives. There's a lot of folks in this room. You certainly didn't take an oath of poverty to do your job, but you didn't plan on getting rich. I say that as a teacher very clearly. I did not plan on getting rich being a teacher, but I did the best job I could every day because I knew it made a difference. I'm going to find someone in this role. We're going to bring in experts from the outside who are helping me in that hiring process. And then we're going to approach technology differently on how we implement it and how we ask state government to do that. Um, this one could have been done better, but I have to tell you, I have been on the federal side of this. It was my bill that asked the Department of Defense and the VA, imagine this crazy thought, to use the same electronic health record. It used to be when you left, some of you in here who are veterans, you left service and they handed you this big paper file that said, this is your 201 file, don't lose it. <laughs> because you were gonna get every shot again and everything that happened to you and you're gonna have to prove it. It makes sense that they, they talk together. But those of you who are familiar with technology and electronic health records, it is much more complex than a database and just plugging it in. With that being said, I can tell you that we're taking an active role, especially in Minlars, that we have done go, no-go meetings where I sit in there with the engineers. I wanted it to look like the NASA room before you did a launch on this latest one because I said, I've been in this job four weeks and you're going to launch the fix to Minlars and just kind of see what happens. I'll tell you what will happen if it fails. I will be struggling to get anything done. So we went through that again with these great technicians to help explain me what it was. And we went through, you know, data interface, go. Specialty license plates, go. Communication to Department of Transportation federally, go. All of these things. We went all the way around. And on Sunday afternoon, I gave the go and they launched. And I think there's just project management is a piece of this. Public ownership is a piece of this. And you went back to the money of this. I went to the Republicans acknowledging for them to vote for more money for Minlars is like pulling wisdom teeth. I, I get it. They're going to have to go back home. So I say, what you should expect out of me is what are the metrics that we're going to get out of this? What is your timeline? What is the reduction in time that it takes to get a license after you do this? And what is your long range plan to implement when you move from legacy systems to new technology? And are you willing? And I gave them this, are you willing to look at the private sector? I said, yes, because many of you know, Minlars history, Minlar's history was a Hewlett Packard project to start with. And I'm not saying that to deflect from the state's responsibility. What I am telling you is it's not a magic bullet just to say, we're going to give this to the private sector. Because again, those who said, how hard could it be to get a license? Why don't you just go borrow Wisconsin's? Because Wisconsin's laws are different than ours. And so when the legislature puts things in, the software has to match what the law says. When do you get a provisional license? What happens when your license comes back after losing it for a suspension? All those things are part of the system. Not excuses, but reasons for why this was more complex. I but if you need a specialty plate, go get it quick. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I want the, to let the uh, state for the record that you brought up Minlars on your own. I didn't even have to ask about yes. it. Oh, uh, I'm owning that thing now. I know that, yeah. whether I like it or not. Oh, there's so. a report due out tomorrow on the, how, uh, from the legislative auditor. How, how bad might that be? Here's what it is. It is going to be honest. It may be bad, but I view it as a golden opportunity to what they put out to fix those deficiencies. We've been doing that. We have workarounds. The system doesn't work. So these county registers that, that do the work for you, um, they have 22 workarounds they have to do. Our newest release, 1.15 that went out Monday, takes that down to, to, to 13. And so um, we'll continue to get better on it and, and do the best we can. Well, this is sort of an admittedly self-serving question, but the executive branch is subject to the Data Practices Act, and, and as are your agencies. But that hasn't always meant in the past that uh, journalists and citizens are able to get information easily. Uh, how are you going to respond to requests from, from journalists and, and anyone who might ask uh, for data that your administration might not want them to have? Yeah. Well, I've always erred on the side of, uh, and this is a history of this. I'm not asking you just to believe me. I'm a am the author of the Stock Act that said, you know what? Legislators should tell you which stock they own and report that so that you can at least know what they're doing before they put something on. Because if I'm going to be invested in a healthcare or let's say a technology company, 
Why am I using that as a fix? And so this idea of transparency in government is the only way to win back public trust. So my take, and we did this, something you saw happen that hadn't happened. This surprises me this hadn't happened. We invited the media and everyone to hold a hearing on corrections. It made sense to me. If you're going to hold a hearing on corrections, do it in a correctional institution. So you can actually look around and see what's happening. So we went out to Stillwater, invited the press back in. Our goal is to try and find that, that spot between protecting citizens' personal privacy. But it's my take is, is that what's requested and should be out there. And I'm already getting these data practices requests, and they come in, and I'm, I'm getting used to this, where they say, freeze. Don't delete any text now to these, 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 these people or whatever. And I'm like, okay. You better just stop deleting everything. So that's right. So, yeah. And I said, my mom, you know, and, there's a, and she, they want to see that. But, but the point is, is yes, on how do you do this and what the public can see? How do you talk about this? I mean, my mantra in life is, is that you better be willing to say things behind closed doors that you would say publicly. Here's just a, a little anecdote about how the world is changing about this, how data practices is one thing. I was up door knocking with Stu Laurie a few weeks ago in that special election up there. And we were standing on a doorstep and I knocked on the door and he and I are talking or whatever. And later that night, he told me, oh, my buddy called me. He wasn't home, but he heard us and we were talking on the front step and his doorbell recorded it or whatever. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> And he said, and the governor talking about why it was important to win these things, to invest in the future. And I'm like, oh, good. Speak, <laughs> speak. I wasn't complaining about something or uh, the bad chili I had at home, whatever it would be. Trying to make the case that for all of us, I'm not talking about making people paranoid, but I think the only way that you can trust is, and I mean, these, I get it. The folks who were here earlier, if they believe those decisions are being made behind closed doors, they will never believe in the social permit. Now, in all fairness, I people say, oh, you're Pollyannish to get people to believe. I supervised the high school lunchroom for 20 years. I'm not naive. I am not naive. But I am willing to say on this data practices, we should try our best and, and be held accountable. Uh, we may disappoint you and the decision will certainly not be on what you should see. It may be on privacy and how things are going. But I, I encourage you to, to keep doing that. That's why I push the stock act and some of those things. Well, you also brought up the Senate special election, which was a DFL seat for decades and uh, didn't, I don't think go the way you maybe wanted it to. Uh, what do you think happened there? And what does it mean for this session to have a little bit uh, more comfortable Republican majority yeah. in the Senate? Well, and again, I certainly take criticism on it, but several things went into that decision. First of all, when it comes to election, I trust voters. So they made the decision they made and, and I trust them to do that. With that being said, it was my responsibility to go out and find the best commissioners possible to deliver on these. And in the case of that, Senator Lori, now Commissioner of Human Services, um, I interviewed incredibly talented people. I believe he has the best capacity to serve you as the citizens in the largest agency in the state government, the largest expenditure in state government, and I think could be argued the biggest impact for so many people from from birth to death. Um, so it, it changes it a little bit, but I, I think the goal on that, I trust that uh, Senator Rarick, who was elected, will serve his constituents well. Um, I certainly, yes, I think having a Democrat would be there, but uh, in that case, uh, they elected a senator who supports the gas tax, so that will move in our direction. And I think the citizens of Minnesota um, made their voice heard in that special election. We'll work with them. I certainly respect that election certificate. And uh, I will take the criticisms of uh, maybe you put a seat at play. Uh, the greater good for Minnesota outweighed that to find the best qualified person to serve them. And that's the choice I made. Well, someone from the audience asks about affordable access to internet. Uh, will broadband and, and internet access be part of your budget that we'll see next week? Yes. Uh, and this is, a ch this is a challenging one because I, I do believe in markets. I believe markets create competition. I believe... Uh, markets create innovation, but I also believe markets have limitations. And in some of these services, if there's not an economy of scale to run that final mile, much like rural electrification, there's a role for the state to step in in the most efficient manner. I do view internet access like other basic utilities like water and electricity now. Uh, this is not a nice to have thing so my kids can stream Netflix all day, which they do. But <laughs> We are creating the haves and have nots. If I'm talking about equity and school funding, if I'm talking about equity and LGA, so it doesn't matter if you live in, in Hat Lake or Minnetonka, your education is going to be on the same level, your access to there. If I create the haves and have nots in access to broadband, it puts you at a disadvantage both educationally and 
economically. So there is going to be a big push to figure out the best way to do that. Uh, we also have a question, and I had this question about tax conformity. Um, that That's something that I, I think legislators feel like they want to do this year and think they should do this year. Uh, you've also suggested maybe some reduction in tax rates. Are, are these all going to be part of a package that we'll see tomorrow? Yeah, I think or, I'm sorry, next week. Yeah, next week. Yes, those are all on the table. And tax conformity should happen. I, the federal government passed a tax bill. Um, full disclosure, I voted against and thought was the bat, the wrong way to go, but it passed. Um, what I know is, is in Minnesota, and the role I have now is, is I don't believe that that tax bill is living up to its promise. And when we do conformity, it should make sense for Minnesotans to do that. Now, just in, to make sure you understand here, Minnesota revenue is prepared. Your ability to file your taxes, which some of you may be able to do, are all fine for this year. So it's not as if we're rushing to April 15th to try and get this done and, and push it through. That's not the case at all. But I do think it makes sense. I think this gives us an opportunity, in my opinion, to right some of the wrongs in the last tax bill. If there is going to be tax relief in this bill, it is going to be aimed at working class people, not corporate or not some of those, because again, more corporate tax rates breaks went back than their entire amount they ever paid that went into that. And it's not that this is tax the rich or do whatever. We were told that this would have investments, capital investments and all of that. It did not do that. What we saw was a lot of stock buyback, which is fine. They did it legally. I just don't think it builds the capacity in a state like we can do if we do this right. So I am committed to tax conformity. I'm committed to fairness in our taxation. I, as a middle-class school teacher before I did this job, understand that what it means when someone's taxes change one way or another. I also have been a firm believer in this, that uh, one of the best economic growth and job creator was extra spending money in the middle-class pocket, not you know, extra stock buyback on the other end. That doesn't have as big of a uh, ripple effect through the economy as it does when middle-class people see real tax relief. Uh, we have a question from the audience about either someone's uh, least favorite or most favorite topic, depending on who you ask the Metropolitan Council. Uh, the question is, what are your priorities for this group? Uh, you do have a new person in charge there that you uh, appointed? We do. And uh, and going with a mayor, some of you may be seeing a pattern. I have a lot of mayors. We were also saying I have a lot of uh, instructors at the Humphrey <laughs> Institute that, that we get, because these tend to be. And, and mayors, again, have to deliver. If you're a mayor, you don't get to mess around with theoretical discussions that are never going to be described solved. You've got to actually fix the pothole in the street. And so having Mayor Slawick over at Met Council understand this is an incredibly important organization that delivers services. It's not just transit, it's water, it's everything else. It's smart in how we do this, but I am also very cognizant um, that there's frustrations in how the Metropolitan Council is seen. One of the first things I did was expand some of the folks that are in there and have a say in this to make sure that folks feel like there's transparency in the Met Council, Met Council decisions. But I think they are going to be at the cutting edge of, of how do we talk about issues like density? How do we talk about issues of transit on a, on a broader scale, which I believe very strongly in? I believe that creates better livable communities. I think, again, if we are going to talk, um, climate change and the impacts of it. I need that energy that was in this room from some of these folks helping me with transit. I need them helping me with some of these other things. And I think that's the Met Council's role. But I also think we're going to have to work pretty hard to help reestablish some of those uh, trust and relationships. I mean, when, I, when the Met Council ended up as a bill in the United States Congress, um, that told me that whether I agree, I didn't agree with then former Congressman Lewis, but I did agree that there was enough things bubbling up about people understanding what the Met Council did, how did its governance work, how did citizen engagement happen that we needed to address that. And I think that's why I picked a, uh, a well-respected leader, picked someone who's, who's actually impacted by this, and then starting down that road of expanding citizen involvement in the Met Council. Well, I'll ask you just for the last question, what I, something I asked the leaders last week, when you look at the end of this session and you get to May, May or, or beyond, depending on how things go, uh, what does a successful end of session look like to you? Uh, what do you think you can accomplish and would be considered a success? Well, I think we took the priorities of Minnesota that we, uh, we started to move and put the down payment on uh, that generational change and, and in education of making sure we bring back equity to education funding, creating those paths for career development, uh, that we actually are moving towards a real solution, not just a Band-Aid 
on healthcare and healthcare costs and ensuring, again, my goal on that is, and I feel a sense of urgency on this, is that healthcare is a basic human right and Minnesota should be able to deliver that to all of its citizens. And let's figure that out how we're going to do that. And then I think that the session ends with some of those, again, these are my priorities, but that they're done in a way that was respectful, that the debate was honest, heated at times, um, but not personal. And we start to move forward on what the reality is. Because here's the situation. The roads are crumbling. They're at a D minus. We have to come out of this with a plan to try and get there. I have laid out mine. I am open to some other options on that. But to come out with nothing, uh, I'm not willing to accept that. And then I think the whole tone and the way that the openness and transparency of the process was heard, I think the healthiness of the debates and the, the the vision that goes into them on both sides is played out in the public's mind. And we walk away shaking hands and believe that Minnesota got a little bit better in those promises that we have that, that you should have the opportunity to achieve the dream for you and your family. You should have safe and prosperous communities. We should reduce the, uh, the inequities that we have in education, in housing, uh, for our communities of colors, those things should all be part of what we're moving towards and then laying the groundwork for going to the next one. I always say this as a, as a coach, people don't like to hear the, the, the football analogies or things like that. I watch the difference between winning programs, whether it be speech and debate or theater or football is seeing this as a long process and not seeing each season in itself as a siloed up, meaning we need to get done with this and not start at ground zero next time, but start where we end it and then keep moving. That's how you keep elevating things up instead of it just spiraling down And each session is the same old stupid nonsense, the same old debates. Let's clear the underbrush and pass some things we can pass. We should have an opioid bill. We should have a, a detracted driving bill. We should have a voting bill. Those things should come in the next month or so. Get those done, move on. Uh, well, this concludes this part of the program. Just hang on just for a second, Governor. Kate is gonna do a few remarks and then we'll... Thanks. Yeah. Well done. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Governor. Thank, Thank you, Brianna. Uh, we're glad to see everyone here. On behalf of the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance, I want to um, give an acknowledgement from uh, Larry Jacobs, who, for those of you who are frequent flyers at our events, are used to seeing Larry up on this stage. He is currently out at Oxford in the UK. So what time is it? He's probably finishing late dinner now. So uh, he'll be back with us next month uh, to be with us for our, our upcoming programs. I do wanna let you know about a few upcoming CSPG events. I know many of you enjoy these. We have one, uh, registration is already open for an event on um, February 26th, and that is on women leaders in both the Minnesota legislature, legislature and in uh, US Congress. That's gonna be hosted by the excellent Catherine Pearson, political science professor here, uh, and featuring former state representatives, Aaron Murphy and Jennifer Loon. So that's February 26th here at noon. On March 1st, for those of you who uh, come from Southeast Minnesota or have any friends in the um, Southeast Minnesota area, we're gonna be on the road down in Austin and hosting a conversation as part of our Courageous Conversation series around the state, looking at the aging workforce in the state and in particular, how older adults can be part of the solution to some of Minnesota's workforce challenges. So I invite you to join us in Austin on March 1st. And then registration is not yet open, but very soon. So keep an eye out for, this is gonna be a great conversation with former Congressman Eric Paulson, and that's gonna be hosted by Public Radio's Gary Eichten. So Gary Eichten and Eric Paulson, the date for that is March 12th. And so if you get our emails or go on our website or Twitter, just keep an eye out for when registration opens for that one, because I think that's gonna be a popular event uh, here at the Humphrey School. And finally, if you turn over your program, I wanna thank our uh, donors who support our major initiatives, uh, which you'll see on your program there. We do encourage and welcome contributions at all levels uh, from individual up to organizational. Do I sound like I'm on public radio right now? Everyone's <laughs> been hearing this a lot. Uh, these programs are truly supported by a public support and I do invite you to join us. Gifts to our center come through the University of Minnesota Foundation. So that is a charitable gift to the U of M. And so if you're interested in exploring that, again, at any level, I'd love to talk with you. My email and phone is on the back of your program there. And I invite you to join us if you in particular, and I know you do because you're here, even though it's snowy and the roads aren't great. Uh, if you enjoy these face-to-face -face substantive 
uh, conversations, particularly bringing forward different voices and combating some of the siloing and polarization that we're seeing. That's our goal and we know and we hope that you continue to be here with us. Um, so I'll turn it back to Brianna to close our program today. Uh, I don't have too much more to add. I just want to thank the governor for his time. It's really generous of you to spend this time. <laughs> Thank you.